Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Happy New Year, everyone. This is the first Sunday of Christmas, January 1st, 2023. Um, our readings uh, this uh, Sunday uh, will be from Isaiah 63, verses 7 through 9. The psalm is the 148th. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 2, reading verses 10 through 18. And our gospel is the second chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 13, reading through verse 23. And I should note that there is also a Sermon Brainwave episode on the text for the name of Jesus, which also occurs on January 1st. Um, which is a Sunday this year. So we'll do that. You'll be able to listen to that as well. Yes, depending on on what you want to acknowledge on this Sunday. And we should just, I'm sure all of our preachers have, have already figured this out, but where there's only one Sunday of Christmas, and then we move to the baptism of our Lord. And so... That's that's cause for a little bit of pause, you know, that we're we'll go to the baptism and then we're right into uh, the season of Epiphany. And uh, and so a number of a number of pastors, preachers, congregations will do something different on a Sunday like this, like a, a hymn, a hymn, singing hymns, carols, just to eke out a little bit more Christmas before things shut down and we move right along into, uh, into the next liturgical season, but we move, uh, we move a little, you know, we, we move farther in our lives as well. And so this first Sunday of Christmas uh, is an important Sunday because we're still in that season and the preacher might want to, yes, we have the text before us, but the preacher might want to, Think about then what what still needs to be said about Christmas. Uh, what what themes or what uh, what claims or what things to think about uh, still you still want your congregation to hear, and uh, and how is it that that can be expressed on this on this particular Sunday, albeit with a, a gospel reading that's exceedingly difficult, uh, but. Um, but that's maybe one thing for the preacher to think about. Yeah, this, um, not just to play with the first of the year, but this scene is set in time. Uh, uh, it's not just a 2000 year old record, but it's in the middle of events that are happening around in this, this ancient context. And in our present context, we can appreciate um both the urgent and the important, but also the intrusiveness of the activities um, that um, we could miss because it seems so obvious, uh, especially if we're uh, holding on to, you know, singing the familiar hymns and, and as you said, Caroline, eking out a little bit more of Christmas. Um, but as we enter this new year, what does it mean that this is the realization of all that was promised. And the way that it happens, as you've already suggested, is horror. Mm -hmm. it, it's the worst of all horrors. If, if ever there was a need for a savior, it's now. Uh, the, the text tells us children are abandoned killed in their own homes, sought out by the very ones that are assigned to bring peace to the community. And if the government hasn't been able to bring us together, maybe we need to hear that there is a God keeping dreams alive. So that, so that we're reminded that the promise and the promise maker uh, is trustworthy. So all that we get throughout the Gospel of Matthew, beginning even here, is scripture fulfilled, but the events recorded keep repeating themselves. So the horror that I just listed that comes right out of the text, in some neighborhoods, it sounds a lot like the horror we're living in. And so I repeat, 
we need God with us. We need this promise-keeping God to fulfill that promise. So this word is 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 a is a very present word, not just a rehearsal from two thousand years ago. Yeah, I appreciate that joy a lot. It's, it's it Christmas gets real in a hurry mm-hmm. in year A with this text where what sounds like you know joy celebration nothing but goodness is quickly revealed to uh, be deeply troubling to a world run by folks like Herod mm-hmm. i think one thing we can say about this is Herod understands the christmas story better than most people in the narrative yes uh as do the magi we'll get back to them though at epiphany but um, and the Magi could be, you know, really important, smart people. They might kind of be boneheads. It's not exactly clear how people are supposed to respond to that word Magi in, in Greek. Uh, but nevertheless, they do the right thing and they respond to God in the right way. And so it's astounding whether or not they are the best of the best or the, the goofballest of the goofballs. But the um, but Herod gets it. And so if you're a tyrant and you think like Herod, he knows exactly what's going on. And he responds the way a tyrant should to a threat like this should in quotes there. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, it tells us a lot about him, but it also tells us a lot about tyranny in general. And it tells us a lot about Jesus and what it means to be the Messiah in this, in Matthew's imagination for sure. And more broadly, and that's uncomfortable. People will think like, couldn't you have held this one for a couple more weeks? You know, it's only the eighth day of Christmas after all. And, um, but I'm still wearing the vest and uh, it's, but you see what I mean? It becomes an interesting story about not just that Christmas is threatening, but like you said, Joy, it holds up a mirror to, if not individual people that you want to name in your society, at least to special, you know, individual forces and, and the types of cultural currents that are always about self-preservation, no matter who gets in your way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or not preservation that's too that's too weak of a term right dominance no matter who gets in your way power yeah, yeah the ma- the the um maintaining of power mm-hmm. and the the lengths to which we will uh go to make that happen uh, and and that's exactly exactly what this text is about and uh and it and it and immediately of course puts at the forefront uh the resistance to a kingdom that Jesus will bring, uh, where blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, blessed are those who hunger and search for righteousness. And so uh, you, since this is also a return to Matthew, and this is the year of Matthew, you you want to go forward a little bit and say, well, what is this, you know, what's so threatening about <laughs> what's so threatening about, you know, another, uh, another king in the neighborhood or whatever, but it's so antithetical to the powers that be and, you know, to what extent they don't even know what to do with it um, except for kill it. Uh, but how, and it, I think, I think, it, I think a sermon on this too has to, to say where and how we see that resistance to righteousness and resistance to uh, uh, the poor in spirit and the and and the resistance to justice. Um, this is not just a story that happened uh, two thousand years ago. It happens over and over and over again. And this is and this is the world our people are leaving Sunday morning worship to live in until they return to us again. And so uh, it, it, yes, it's, it's fast this year. Um, We only get this one Sunday of East of, of Easter. Wow. (laughs) I jumped very fast through the, through the uh, Christian year. Um, We only get this, this one Sunday of Christmas, but that's the world we're living in right now is that we've got to hold on to this promise made real while we're facing such uncertainty, while we're ser- while we're facing uh, so much that has been resistant 
to what we've just been celebrating, what we've just been anticipating as we've gone through the season of Advent and Christmas. And here we are, and it's a new year starting, and we're right back where we were at it again. And so we need to offer this the way that this ancient text has been preserved as a promise of let's rehearse where God is showing up, where God is doing what God has promised and what it looks like in the very real world where, like you said, uh, the powers that be inside and outside of our circles are don't know what to do with it. And sometimes in their not knowing what to do with it, it's destroy it. And sometimes it's to appropriate it. Um, and our, our task is to tell the story so that folks understand there's a different worldview. It's not the government. It's not the society or the culture. It's the revelation of God made known in Jesus that is the Christian witness. And tell it as if all of eternity is is turned on it because in fact it has. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the historical judgment on this passage is we don't know about this from any other sources. And so we're not sure if it really happened, but then most historians will quickly say, but it sure sounds like something Herod would have done mm -hmm. <laughs> based upon what we know of him. But the other thing too, that we want to draw from that is if Herod did stuff like this, if Herod could quote unquote, get away with it, that means there are other people around him who are endorsing it, or at least who are unwilling to stand up. So before we turn this into a story that's about one kind of rogue, lunatic ruler, it's also about a society. Because Herod had, a lot of people thought Herod was great for the local region. Yeah. Little, 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 <laughs> little unhinged at times and a very interesting story about his own family. But for the most, for a lot of people, he brought a lot of wealth a lot of stability, a lot of status into the region. And so you think about what are people willing to overlook, right? With, Matthew doesn't take us there, of course, but but before we want to turn Herod into some kind of lone monster who's just rampaging, remember that he's part of a system that has enough people who want him there and appreciate him being there. Make your own connections from that point, you know, to uh, yep. to our own lives. I can make a few. I could too. Well, yeah, and but then make sure we hold up a mirror when we do that as well, right? When mm -hmm. we think about what are the what's the quote unquote collateral da damage we're willing to um, tolerate for the sake of what you know. Mm -hmm. exactly. And what are we willing to stand up to uh, mm -hmm. or against, yeah. or how is it that we are complicit and and uh, behaviors and and or main, maintaining of powers that are. Uh, that are to our benefit, but to great, uh, great harm to others. Um, and so I think we can think it's, yeah, it's an important, uh, I don't know if I want to say lesson about this text, but an insight into the human condition and then, and then, but, and then who will stand up and then that's, uh, and maybe that's the connection I would make to Isaiah uh, that, you know, I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praise were the acts of the Lord, uh, and the great favor to the house of Israel. I mean, are we, are we ones who are willing to stand up and, and recount those gracious deeds and rehearse those, uh, praise were the acts of the Lord when they're, uh, often against, <laughs> um, against what society expects or what a society wants or what the world wants uh how how are we going to keep the christmas message going or does it easily get forgotten in um uh, in the realities of our surroundings yeah um isaiah uh, 63 is exactly what we're doing here isn't it we are recounting the gracious acts and when i thought about that text and thought about it against the reality that is spelled out in, in Matthew. Um, I recently um, read, um, I think it's Philip Haley is uh, the author, um, Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed. It's the story of uh, the 
um, La Chambon, the French um, uh, who uh, um, protected uh, the Jews uh, during the Holocaust. And um, this must have been, a, the, the, the text I was reading must have been an anniversary um, um, uh, publication because there's a, there's a preface to the preface where the author is saying that uh, when the book was first published, um, the first letter in response that he received was someone saying, you know, this group of people that no one knows, this one little community uh, marginalized, um, so they did something nice. The reason the world changed was not because of this sentimental story and these few lives that were preserved. It, it, the difference was made because of the war and the difference was made because of power and violence and, and, and this heavy handedness that came in. Um, but he goes on in this preference to say that he received uh, other letters that were just the opposite. And probably the, the one that spoke the most was when he was speaking about this story and a woman um, said, are you talking about Le Chambon? And she put it in a certain village because there are more than one Le Chambon. And uh, he said, yes, saying, okay, she really knows. And then she very quietly said, um, thank you for telling this story because of that community. My three children's lives were, shared, were saved. And uh, he's not telling this from a faithful uh, a perspective, but in this recount, he says, this is evidence of the gracious act, a miracle maybe. And he says that that's the kind of language that this deserves. And, and I repeat that to say, that's what we're describing here. Horror of all horrors, but we're willing to be the ones who will recount the gracious, miraculous act of the intrusion of God. And for some, it might seem that this isn't what's changing the world. And yet we tell the story because it has brought hope to so many lives for centuries. Well, it seems the psalmist also gives us words for that or praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights. I mean, that's, you know, I, Again, this is one of those one of those psalms that if your sermon goes in that direction, it gives people the language uh, and the expression to give that praise themselves to uh, to be the ones who are recounting the acts of God uh, as kind of a practice run right for the real world. <laughs> and so somehow I would I would incorporate the psalm in a uh, in a way that that you're. Uh, inviting people to um, do it and not just talk about uh, what does it mean to give witness to God uh, in a world of resistance and and this is what it sounds like and and if you and if you in those moments you can't really come up with the words or not really sure what to say then the psalm gives us you can always fall back on the psalm and it gives you the words to speak. Yeah, I'd rather you spend time praising than explaining it. Explaining it. <laughs> so, yeah. but you're right. It, it, but it gives that license to mm -hmm. maybe cut the sermon short and yeah, get back yeah. to singing. Yep. And if you don't, I I just want to say whether you go back to singing, um, all preachers should at least read the commentary that is on Hebrews. Um, mm -hmm. I was really grateful because it challenges pre preachers to draw attention to why Christmas matters mm -hmm. from a biblical and dare I say a theological and definitely a covenantal perspective. So whether you use it or not, do pay attention to the why, uh, because the commentary definitely uh, challenges us to remember that. Yeah, Brian has us, uh, it, it, it invites preachers the opportunity to reflect on the purpose of the incarnation from a from a different perspective and i and that's one of the gifts of of 
the texts, the many texts that we have, right, in the Bible, and particularly in this case in the New Testament, these, uh, this, you know, twenty-seven witnesses to that are uh, who are interpreting the Christ event and what it means, and uh, and so Brian does a. Um, beautiful job. Shout out to Brian. He was my classmate at Emory. Uh, Shout out. And he's been, he's been at Hebrews for a long time. He's just, (laughs) uh, and it's one of those books that we often don't know what to do with. And yet um, he, he brings the, the words of Hebrews here to the Christmas story that, you know, it, it changes the, the, the direction of the kaleidoscope just a little bit, right? And so all of a sudden you see, you see uh, different angles and you see different colors because of this perspective on the incarnation and the purpose of the incarnation that maybe you hadn't thought about before. Yeah, I'll confess that as I was reading this passage and preparing, looking at Hebrews 2, that uh, verses 14 and 15, as I first read them, I thought, Oh, this is not the right week for this. You know, the the idea of of destroying the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, free those who are held in slavery by the fear of death. I thought this is a little much for the first Sunday after Christmas. But of course, it, it goes great with Matthew 2. Mm-hmm. And you think about, okay, so what does this look like to be enslaved to the fear of death? What does it mean to have power over death? Right. So it jolts you back into the perspective of, oh, this is how I need to read Matthew 2. I need to think along these lines. And then, of course, as I finally started to say, oh, this is really actually helpful this week, I could imagine a, a sermon that that puts those two into a real interesting creative dialogue. But even some of the language of our Christian, of our Christmas hymns, our carols, right? the idea of, you know, born that we may no more, may no, born that we no more may die, right? Hark the herald angels sing. I mean, some of the language in there made me think, uh, you could do some really fun work with that to be sat down with your hymnal as well and 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 talked about that. What does Christmas mean? And just to say, here's one bit of imagery that is gritty, but appropriately so if we think that Matthew 2 actually speaks about our world or represents our world well. So you can have fun with that as a preacher. 